Our second speaker for today is Dr. James Schnabel. Dr. James, Dr. Schnabel is an assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska. James' research focuses on employing new methods to combine uh, phenomic and genomic data in grain crops. He conducts interdisciplinary research with plant scientists, computer scientists, engineers, statisticians, and plant breeders to develop new quantitative genetic and high throughput phenotyping techniques to analyze novel types of data. James has a PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. Today, he's going to talk about the role of high throughput phenotyping in plant breeding. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Schnabel. Well, so thank you all for the uh, invitation to come out here. It's, it, it looks to be a really fascinating program. Getting a little bit of feedback. Closer? Okay. <laughs> all right. So I find it's always helpful. I'm still hearing a lot of echo. That's fine for everyone else? All right. Well, then I will try and talk through it, and if I pause in the middle of a sentence, you'll know why. So I find it's always helpful when we, I give these talks about plant phenotyping to take a step back a little bit and, to, you know, why are we interested in this area of research? Uh, and ah, there we go. So this, is, this slide is a couple years out of date now, but the, it's important to, to realize, I mean, the reason that there is so much investment in plant breeding is because we have a problem. Uh, demand for food is growing, both because of increased population and more so at this point in uh, dietary shifts. So going from a, uh, diets with more uh, grain in them to more meat means we need uh, a lot more total grain uh, being produced. And until recently, until uh, say 2000 or so, we were really keeping up with growing demand. Uh, and then something changed and, and prices started to go up. They've come down a little bit again, but they're going to keep going up. And the reason for this is fascinating, and it actually comes from a group or, uh, of economists at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. It's, it's fascinating to be able to work with these uh, different groups. So this is a paper that came out a, a couple years ago by a guy named uh, Patricio Grassini at the university. And he looked at the yields of, of three of the, the main crops that provide more than half of all the calories eaten around the world, either directly, people eat them, or indirectly, we feed them to animals that we then eat. And what he found is that in two of those three, uh, rice and wheat, we've actually hit yield plateaus. So until now, we've been able to increase yield, both through breeding and improved agronomic practices. And in many areas around the world, uh, increased uh, for both rice and wheat, that has sort of uh, tapered off. Now, the third of the three crops that provide half of all the calories we eat is, is maize, is corn. And that one is still going up. Let's skip forward one slide. Uh, so what you see here is the introduction first of uh, two hybrid breeding, uh, around 1940, and then the switch to single hybrid production. And since then, uh, yield of corn has been going up about two bushels an acre in the U.S. So that seems like we still have that under control until you look at what it costs to get this uh, linear increase in grain yields. So we're getting uh, linear increases in yield, but we're having to spend more and more money every year to get that extra two bushels an acre. So that's a, that's a problem. That's not sustainable over the long run. So the, uh, the solution is to start changing the way that we do breeding. If we keep doing breeding the same way, we have to spend more and more money to get more and more uh, difficult uh, traits interested into the germplasm. And so the, the first solution to this was to go from conventional breeding to genomic selection. So breeding consists of cycles. You have to generate a, a bunch of new germplasm. You have to evaluate that germplasm. Uh, you take the best lines, you intercross them, and you go back through. And the number of cycles you can conduct in a given length of time has a very strong relationship to the overall increase in yield you can get. So standard breeding, this cycle takes about five years from generating uh, a new line to be able to evaluate it and say, you know, what are the, the good ones, what are the bad ones, and then you go back into to both you release the best ones into production and you go back into another cycle. So the, the first innovation here was something called genomic selection, where you use, uh, you build a statistical model using data from a lot of lines that have already been evaluated to pick uh, what are your winners and what are your losers before you do phenotyping. And this allows you to do about 15 times more cycles 
uh, in a given length of time than with conventional braiding, uh, in this case in corn, but with similar speed ups in other crops. So this is wonderful because it, it eliminates one bottleneck, but it, uh, whenever you eliminate a bottleneck, you create more pressure on whatever the new limiting step is. And right now, the limiting step in plant breeding really is our ability to evaluate lines. So genotyping has decreased by about uh, 200,000 fold the cost of, of generating genomic data about a line, uh, whereas the cost of uh, phenotyping for agronomic traits like yield has stayed essentially constant over that uh, same period of time. And as I mentioned, whenever you eliminate a bottleneck, you create a, a new bottleneck. So initially, our bottleneck was breeding cycles. Uh, by going to various molecular breeding techniques, we were able to eliminate that bottleneck, but then the limit was genotyping. Now, with improved genotyping technology, that bottleneck goes away, so the, the limitation is yield trials. And that is why, for, for plant breeding, it really is essential to look at investing in these, these new technologies and ways that we can evaluate lines uh, faster and cheaper. So what is high throughput phenotyping? It's not this. So phenotyping, uh, conventional phenotyping, I think of as anything you either have to send somebody out with a combine and harvest yield, or something where I can send some graduate students into the field and they have to measure traits by hand. They note them down in a notebook or maybe in a, in a Kindle. So the advantages, you know, this, is, this is all stuff that you folks are probably familiar with. With high throughput phenotyping, we can measure more plants more often. So in addition to measuring the same traits that I can send a graduate student in the field to measure, uh, I can start to measure new things like uh, time series and rates of change traits uh, because I have many, many measurements uh, instead of a single snapshot. And there are a lot more things that we can measure non-destructively, uh, which allows us to come back and evaluate the same plant multiple times uh, throughout the season. In order to make this work, though, there are really uh, three separate things that have to, to go right. The first is the technology to collect the, the imaging or other remote sensing data. The second is, are the computational approaches that allow us to convert that image data into numerical phenotypes. And the third is using those numerical phenotypes to map genes uh, or QTL, build genomic prediction models, and actually integrate that into a breeding program. And it turns out we're really good at this last one already because we get lots of other types of phenotype da phenotyping data, and quantitative geneticists have worked a lot of this. Uh, there's been a huge amount of investment in this first one at UNL at, uh, uh, here and all, all over the world. So I would say this is really the bottleneck within the bottleneck of phenotyping, is how we go from a bunch of photos or LIDAR data to something that is actually going to be predictive in a breeding program. So I have here a very complicated flow chart of how high throughput phenotyping works. I'm not going to talk about everything in this flow chart. We're going to narrow this down to a couple of points. So you have to start with plants. You go from the plants to images, and you have to get numerical phenotypes, and then you have to show that these phenotypes actually are predicting something about the plants, and ideally that they're linked to something that breeders care about. There are lots of things you can measure that probably uh, have no redeeming value. <laughs> I'm not going to give any examples, because then I'm sure someone would come up with a model where it would impact yield. So going from the plants to the images, uh, this can be conducted by engineers, by agronomists, by biologists. but. Uh, as I said, it also is really expensive. You have a, a lot of investments in infrastructure. You've heard a lot about uh, the infrastructure at UNL, so we can go through these slides, slides very quickly. I always like to show this one about the greenhouse, though. So uh, someone I was talking to before the session started mentioned that there's been a lot of investment in lemnotech-style greenhouses uh, all over the, the world, and I think that's true. What sets our facility apart, and what I'm really excited about, is we really can grow uh, corn plants all the way to maturity. And so, uh, I don't know of anyone else in the public sector who can do that. I'm sure there is someone, but that is very exciting for someone like me. And then again, we have this field system that is coming online. Now these uh, facilities both generate a bunch of image data. And I think the, the thing that we've learned at Nebraska is you generate all this image data, you hand it off to a biologist, and they say, great, now what? <laughs> How do I use this? And uh, this is a, a very important thing, I think, for anyone who's going to integrate uh, phenotyping into a, a real breeding program is to think about this before you've made the investment infrastructure or just the cost of actually running a bunch of plants through one of these uh, systems. And in order to make sense of this, I, I, it's helpful to step back a little bit historically. So before I was uh, ever set foot in a lab, 
They were breeders, and they were, they were special people whose entire job description was that you were a molecular biologist. So maybe you ran you know, PCR markers or RFLP markers or all sorts of uh, technologies that I have to admit I get confused about sometimes. Uh, and that doesn't happen anymore. I, I haven't met anyone in years who would describe themselves just as a molecular biologist because that's something that's just been subsumed. If you are a breeder or a biologist, you need to know how to do that stuff yourself or you need to know enough that you can hire somebody to do it who is not a, uh, a research collaborator there, maybe a service provider. Now at the same time, as the view of what a breeder is expanded, there's a, a new need, which was the bioinformatics. So how do we analyze all the sequence data that's being generated? And again, originally, there were core facilities, there were special people who are bioinformaticians, and you went and you collaborated one of those, with one of those. And while there still are some of those, I think uh, the investment in core facilities is going away over time because like molecular biology now, if you are a breeder or you're a biologist, you're expected to be able to analyze your own data. You have to be able to write some R code or Python code. So the definition of what a breeder is is expanded again. At the same time, we're seeing people who are, uh, their entire expertise is that they are high throughput phenotyping experts. Uh, and the goal of this slide is to get you thinking about what this is going to look like in 10 or 15 years' time, particularly if you are a graduate student right now. Uh, you need to actually be, be learning about how this works yourself. You aren't going to be able to rely on having separate expertise uh, going forward. So stepping back to this, uh, this question of what you do after you have the images, the trick is to have some data to work with before you get your $100,000 data set from your $5 million facility so that you can start working on this. Because figuring out how to analyze image data just takes time. And the way we did this in my lab was to invest in low throughput human powered phenotyping before we got our data sets uh, in order to have some data that would look like the data that was coming off of the, the really expensive high throughput system. So here are a couple of examples. We, uh, the Lemnitec system we have actually rotates the plant. Here we have uh, Chikai who's a student in my lab and he rotates the plant and we have these two master students who you know, do this automated capture with the camera. Uh, <laughs> and similarly we have a top down system that is actually taking a photo uh, about every 30 sec or uh, that must be about every 10 seconds over 14 days. So we can generate really, really large data sets uh, very easily, no problem. Now, I'm not, I would argue this is not the most informative data set, but for figuring out what you're going to do, it, it is quite helpful. So that's how we generate the data that's like the expensive Lemnitec data before we had the Lemnitec data. Similarly, for the field, uh, we worked with uh, Yu Fang, who, who is an uh, amazing guy, if you ever get the chance to meet him. Uh, he was hired, I think, six months before I was at the University of Nebraska. And so we went to him again and said, we, you know, we're going to have this top-down system that's going to be imaging an acre footprint. What can we do to generate data a little bit like that? And as Talish told you, he has this wonderful bicycle system. And so we just started running this through some of the uh, uh, yield trials we were already growing in Nebraska and capturing a bunch of different data. That looks like this. So again, we have data that looks like the expensive data we're hoping to get in this fall or maybe next year, depending on how the plants grow this summer. And so uh, both students in my lab and collaborators can start working on how do we extract numer interesting numerical values from this uh, before the data lands in our lab. Because there's a lot of pressure when you get a $100,000 data set. People want to see results really fast for some reason. They don't want to wait a, a year while you figure it out. So we have the images, we want to go to these uh, traits that are useful to breeders. And yeah, I mean, it, this is look, overlooked a lot. There's sort of this uh, miracle occur step. We have to get around that. Yeah, more of the same thing. So there are essentially three options. How am I doing on time? Good. Okay, great. So you can collaborate, oops, you can collaborate with folks who are expert, experts on this. You can go and find computer vision experts and statisticians and so forth. And sometimes that works really, really well. Some of my favorite interactions since I've been hired have been with these groups of people who have, are really, really smart with a lot of expertise, and we don't even share a common language. If I talk about exper experimental design, I mean something entirely different than when a statistician talks about experimental design. So that can be a lot of fun, uh, but it can also create problems because we have different academic cultures, and sometimes our incentives are not perfectly aligned. And administrators can do some things to uh, change what your incentive structure is, but I mean, there, there are also challenges there. Uh, the second option is to go with commercial providers who already have analysis packages like Lemnitech, uh, and that can also be very frustrating because as Tala mentioned, there are black boxes, and if you need to change things, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, so I, I would actually discourage this one at this stage. 
And the third is you can train your own people to analyze this. Uh, and the limitation here being that you have to find students with the right skill set. Um, and a lot of people who go into breeding, they want to be out walking in the field. They don't like it when you lock them in a room with a computer for six months and say, how do you analyze this data? Uh, I was fortunate in my lab, I had somebody who thought this was a wonderful challenge. Uh, so this is uh, Jakai, I pointed him out on a previous slide. He was the guy who was turning the plant. And so he is uh, taken to a lot of this, the, the very basic image analysis data. Uh, so again, you know, this is just being able to measure height from uh, images. We can get very uh, good correlations with ground truth data. Biomass is also reasonable, not quite as good. And this allows, as I mentioned, that we can actually track the trait of the same plant over time at a resolution that would not be feasible. Uh, with conventional phenotyping, if I send my students in the field every day with meter sticks to measure all the plants, uh, in a few weeks I don't think I would have any students anymore. So this is, is far superior in that regard. And we can see that, um, all right, different uh, genotypes exhibit different patterns of growth uh, over the course of the first couple of months after planting, or month and a half after planting. Uh, and we also, I think, Tala, you already had this, this uh, photo up. So this is work by uh, Trinity, who was a, a master's student, uh, who was co-advised by myself, and then uh, Ashok uh, Samal, who was a computer scientist. And he developed this method for uh, measuring the le length of leaves. Now, you'll notice that initially, uh, if you are familiar with plant biology, there are some problems here with the numbering of these leaves. So his initial idea was he would uh, identify leaves based on their length and use that to track them over time. Obviously, there are some, some biological problems with that. We had a, a lot of meetings talking about how the corn plant actually develops, and he came up with a better system where he was able to track the same leaf uh, throughout development, which was fascinating. Uh, because then, oh, and then again, this is uh, compensating for the fact that leaves die throughout development, and that doesn't change the numbering of all the leaves uh, above that. So once you teach the computer how to take into account the fact that length, lengths of leaves are changing, some leaves are dying, uh, the positions of leaves are changing, you are able to track the rate of extension of every leaf uh, from day to day. And it turns out this is a very useful way for monitoring stress. So when a corn plant is stressed, before you can see any other visible symptoms, uh, the first thing it does is it stops producing new tissue because that's a very expensive process, and if you don't do that, you have a lot more energy to deal with whatever's trying to kill you. Uh, then again, we have the hyperspectral data. Uh, and this again, uh, Jakai has been learning how to do this sort of from scratch. But as you can see, this, oops, this is a false color image, and one of the first things we identified was that the stem is very different from the leaves. So we're able to separate this out. This is uh, subtracting the stem and just getting leaf data and then seeing that uh, both there are very big differences between the, the stem and the leaf, and then when we look at different genotypes over time, we see different patterns of change. And uh, except for us and, and Yufang's group, I don't think anyone has seen this uh, with corn plants before, because most of the hyperspectral data is generated from drones or satellites. You're looking down and you really don't see the stem of the plant. So being able to see from the side, we see different stuff. That's useful. Uh, and then again, working with uh, Yufeng and his student uh, Piyush, we were also able to monitor the concentration of various micronutrients uh, in the leaves of these uh, uh, different genotypes of maize. And this paper is currently in review. Hopefully it'll be out in a few weeks. And that's some, uh, some micronutrients. Uh, here are some others. For example, boron did not work very well at all. Uh, neither did sodium. Now, boron is actually a very difficult one to quantify, even with destructive measurements, uh, for reasons that I won't go into. But you know, some, some of these work, some of them didn't. Now, before I put this slide in, Yufang made me promise to talk about the caveats of this data. So we used cross-validation to estimate the accuracy with which we can predict the concentration of micronutrients in the leaves of the corn plant. But uh, this only tests whether the algorithm works under the, the conditions that we collected our imaging data in. So if the light, lighting conditions change, that's obviously going to change the model. And it only tests with uh, the algorithm works with the genotypes and developmental stages that we've tested. So this looks wonderful. If we then took this out and did a giant screen of 200 genotypes, it's quite possible a lot of the really interesting looking stuff we would find would not be that the micronutrients would be different. It would be that there's something different about the way that those plants produce pigments or something, and so we're, we're getting bad data. So you need to constantly build an additional cross-validation. 
other thing that I really wish I'd known before I got talked into, you know, hey, get involved in this wonderful high throughput phenotyping stuff that we're doing at our facility, is that by being involved in high throughput phenotyping, it means you have to generate a lot more conventional phenotyping data, not less. So these are a bunch of members of my lab uh, con collecting destructive measurements uh, from corn plants at the end of an experiment in the greenhouse and also uh, phenotyping a sorghum field. And we're even collecting uh, microbiome data from the, the soil of these plants. So again, uh, trying to bring in some field soil. It turns out field soil really does not work well in the facility, so you end, then are trying to separate it and mix in sterile sand and stuff so you get something that still works, but that it contains this microbial community that we would find in a Nebraska cornfield. Uh, and the corollary of this is that the best thing you can do for stimulating the development of these algorithms to extract numerical data from image data is to make data sets available where you have uh, high throughput phenotyping data, and it's paired with uh, low, low throughput ground truth data. Now there are, you know, one way to do this is lots and lots of manual work, but I'm lazy. I think that's why I got into computational biology, because I can run an experiment in half an hour. If it doesn't work, it says, you know, error with line 47 instead of, you know, running an experiment in a, with a PCR, and if it doesn't work, you have, well, there's no band. What do I do next? So I want uh, easier ways to get around it. The first solution uh, is to work on automating the collection of ground truth data. So this, again, is a collaboration with Yufeng, uh, where one of his students is developing this robotic arm that can reach out, clamp onto the leaf of the corn plant, and collect a lot of the ground truth data that right now is collected by folks walking around with backpack sensors. So we can replace both the ground truth data and the, the high throughput data in the field. That would be wonderful. Uh, here's some more photos of the robot in action. As you can see, uh, we aren't giving them actual corn plants yet. They're working with this wonderful corn plant simulator because it was still ripping some leaves off the corn plants. So that's uh, a work in progress. The other is to work with genotypes that people are already collecting data on. So I'm fortunate to be a part of this collaboration called uh, Genomes to Fields, which is growing a common set of hybrids. Oh, thank you. Uh, all across the U.S. and collecting very detailed data on the environment and the yield and other ground truth measurements from these. So we can take these same genotypes uh, run them through our high th both our field and uh, greenhouse facilities at UNL, and we instantly have a lot of built-in data on how these uh, varieties perform in the field, not just in one field, but in many different uh, environments. So there may be things that are predictive uh, of yield and you know, low temperature and low water, but not in when you have either high temperature or high water, something like that. So this is a, an interesting data set, and let's see. So the 2014 data from all of this, and actually now the 2015 data has been made available online. So if anyone who's a statistician or a breeder wants to take a look at this data, it's all freely available for you to use. Uh, and the 2016 data, so our goal is to release everything one year after it's collected to the general public. And the, the image data for some of these lines is also available through the uh, Plant Vision Initiative website that Tala mentioned. Uh, more details. Uh, the second is to also use a set of about 400 uh, sorghum lines that are a uh, widely used association panel. And again, this is the same thing. There's been lots of data collected on these lines through expensive, slow, labor-intensive manual phenotyping. We're genotyping the, the same lines, or phenotyping the same lines in the greenhouse, and the hope is both that we uh, can use the publicly available, oops, marker data to map traits. Uh, I, I find that people have a lot more confidence in any phenotyping algorithm once you can map it back to here are the genes that are controlling variation in that trait than just here's something we can measure about the plants, uh, but also then to identify correlations between things we're measuring in our field or our greenhouse with performance in different fields in different years around the U.S. Uh, so every time you overcome a bottleneck in breeding, you create a, a new bottleneck, uh, which can feel a little frustrating, but it is important to keep track of the fact that we are making progress. Uh, so this is what has allowed us to mostly keep up with the growing demand for food around the world. Uh, and there's always going to be that, that next hurdle, but if you just tackle them as you come, I, I'm actually optimistic about the future. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank, uh, I'm very fortunate both to have my, my research group at the University of Nebraska, uh, our collaborators, both in, in statistics and engineering and computer science. Uh, and I will also give a plug that I'm, I'm hiring uh, two postdocs right now, so if there are any graduate students who don't quite feel they're ready for the faculty position yet, uh, come work with me for a couple of years and then hopefully we can get you one of those positions. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.